you ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. Amen. Take your Bible this morning and find 2 Corinthians in chapter number 5. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. We are beginning today a new teaching series called Life on Mission. And our prayer is our staff has been meeting for the last several months planning, praying about this series, that it would be much more than a series, a a time of teaching, but it would become a movement in our church that we as a church would begin to live our lives on mission, joining God in his mission, becoming ambassadors as we partner with God in his mission mission. Now, what we're going to do in the next two to three weeks is this morning, we're going we're gonna to take a look at the mission of God, the mission that he began thousands of years ago, the mission that he continues even today. We're going to take a 30,000-foot look at the overall mission of God and how God invites us to join him in the mission. Next week, we'll get a little lower, about 10,000 feet, and we'll just talk practically about what it looks like to join God in the mission, to be an everyday missionary without packing your bags and moving to Africa or Thailand or India. But as you go about your life on campus, at work, at home, as you're living your life, you can be an everyday missionary. And then Two weeks from today, we're going to place in your hands and provide online on our website tips and helps and resources so that every day you can live on mission, fulfilling the great commission of our God. So this morning, we're talking about the mission of God. And what I want you to know from the very first, even before we dive into the Scripture. Let me tell you about the mission of God. The mission of God is this. The mission of God is redeeming and reconciling people to himself. That's the mission of God. If you know much about the New Covenant, if you know much about the New Testament, you know that's the mission of God. God is reconciling and redeeming people to himself. Now, we know that, and we see that all throughout the New Testament. But there's a particular passage that gives us great insight to his mission, to the message, and how he invites you and me to be a part of it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Would you stand in the honor of the reading of God's Word. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm going to begin reading in verse number 13. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, and therefore All have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. And all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. You ought to underline that phrase in your Bible, the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. That's the mission of God. The mission of God is redeeming and 
reconciling people to himself. And he has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. He continues to say, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. You ought to underline that phrase, the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. May God bless the reading of his word, and you may be seated. You see all throughout that passage, that word reconciliation, the mission of God, reconciling Men and women, boys and girls, people to himself, reconciling and redeeming people to himself. And he invites us to join him in that mission. In fact, we glorify God when we engage in his mission, this ministry of reconciliation. This morning as we think about the mission of our church. The mission of our church is to join God in his mission. What is this mission? It is a mission of reconciliation. It's that word we see over and over and over again throughout the New Testament, but in particular as Paul writes, teaching us about the mission of God, this ministry of reconciliation that we have. That we're Ambassadors of Christ in this ministry of reconciliation. That word reconciliation, it's a, it's a word that, that has to do with relationships. In fact, it, it's a word that means a change in relationships. When those that were enemies are now friends. Those that hated one another now love one another. It's a It's a change of relationship is the word reconciliation. When we read in that passage that we are now given the ministry of reconciliation, it speaks not just of a relationship, but it speaks of the relationship between God and man, a holy God and sinful man. If God in his mission is reconciliation, redeeming and reconciling people to himself, and when you have been born again and you are reconciled to God, therefore you are given the ministry of reconciliation. I ask you this morning in the passage to underline two phrases, the ministry of reconciliation and the message of reconciliation. Those are the two things that you and I are going to examine together this morning. Remember, the mission of God. The mission of God is reconciliation. He's reconciling. He's bringing together and redeeming people to himself. He gives us the ministry of reconciliation. He invites us. He, in fact, not only invites, but he expects us to join him in the ministry of reconciliation. So what I want you to see this morning Again, is a foundation, the very basics, that when you understand and what you see, the ministry and the message of reconciliation, it should motivate you, it should prod you, it should push you to join God in his mission as an everyday missionary in the ministry of reconciliation. As a matter of fact, in laying this foundation, Paul is teaching. Paul says that when you you understand the love of Christ, the love of Christ should compel you to engage in the ministry of reconciliation. We are compelled by the love of Christ. That's what he means by verse number 13 and verse number 14 and verse number 15. When I met Kathy, and I fell in love with Kathy 
30 plus years ago, there was something that, that was very different about this relationship in that my love for her and her love for me, it motivated me to be a better man. What was different about this relationship is that I was motivated, I was compelled to be, to be a harder worker because of her relationship with Christ and her love for Christ and her love for me. It compelled me to want to be a better Christian, to be a better Christ follower. See, that's what love does. Love motivates us. True love compels us. We think about love in a family. In a loving family, the children who know that they are deeply loved by their parents, because of that love that those parents have for them, they're compelled and motivated to honor and to respect those parents. But when you and I, and Paul's saying that when you and I consider the love of Christ, that is exponentially greater and deeper than, 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 than the love of a family. It, it compels us even more. In fact, that's really what he means there in verse number 14. For the love of Christ controls us. That word control means to motivate. It means to compel. Paul is saying the love of Christ compels us to engage in the ministry of reconciliation. It's not just the mission of God. It is our mission because of the love of Christ that we've seen and we've experienced. It compels us. Uh, Paul actually says in verse number 13, the, the idea here is that Paul is so compelled by the love of Christ in his ministry that people thought that he was obsessed People thought that he was insane, that he was crazy. That's what he means in verse number 13. When he says there, he says, uh, uh, for if we are beside ourselves, it's for God. If we are in our right mind, because people thought he was out of his mind, it's for you. That's what it does. That's what it means. When you get a glimpse of the great love of Christ that he has for you, his love that can never be separated, the Bible says, from you, his great love for you, that when you begin to capture his, his great love for you, it, it compels you. It, 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 in fact, even kind of controls you and that you can't help but engage in this Ministry, his ministry of reconciliation. He goes on to say in verse number 14, for the love of Christ compels us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all. Therefore, we all have died. Now, what does he mean by that? We know what he means when he says, and that latter part of Verse number 14, that one has died for all. We know that he's speaking of Christ and that 2,000 years ago, God sent his son to die once for the sins of all mankind. He died once for all. But what does it mean that therefore all have died? It means that he came and he died. Why? Because all of us are slaves to sin. We are in bondage to slave to our to our we're enslaved to sin and selfishness and even to this world. But when Christ died, we died that we are no longer by his death, we are no longer under the control of the power of sin. We weren't able to do it this morning, but you'll witness it again next Sunday as we do most every Sunday right over here, baptism. Baptism, as you've heard me say numerous times, is the outward expression of an inward transformation. The person gets over into the water and we announce their name and they confess Christ. As you turn from your sin and your selfishness, who have you placed your trust, in whom 
Jesus Christ. And we take that person and we take them down into the water and then we bring them out of the water. It is a picture. It is a, it's a picture of the story of Christ and it is their story. Christ died and was buried and rose again. To which that person, they lived, they've been living a life of, in the flesh as a slave to sin. But they have died in Christ. The old them is put to death and buried. And as of today, they're raised to walk a new life in Christ. There's one who died for all, and in his death, we all died. We are no longer under the power of sin and selfishness and of the flesh. Old Alan died a long time ago, and old Alan was buried, and the new Alan walks in faith in Christ. But then he goes on to say, and this being compelled by the love of Christ, verse 14, for the love of Christ compels us because we have concluded this, that one died for all, and therefore all have died. Verse 15, and he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves. Might no longer live for themselves. We are so compelled by the love of Christ that it compels us when we understand his death, his burial, his resurrection, it changes our affections. It compels us in such a way is that it changes the entire purpose of our lives. We no longer live for ourselves, but we live for him, the one who died and was raised for us. Sometimes I see shirts. I see people who wear these shirts, T-shirts, hoodies, sweatshirts that say things like, hunting is life. Soccer is life. Dance is life. Football is life is life. And I think to myself that if that is what your life is all about, you're going to be disappointed. If you put all of your hope in a sport, it's going to fail you. But if you put your hope in Christ, the one who died for you, when you make Christ the greatest priority in your life, Jesus Christ doesn't want to be a part of your life. He demands and expects to be your life. And when you make that your priority, when you make him your priority, you will never, ever be disappointed. Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher, said, if God calls you to be a missionary, never stoop to be a king. It compels us, his love. As we think about this ministry of reconciliation, the mission of God, and he invites us to be a part of it. When you grasp his great love for you, it should compel you to join in the ministry of reconciliation. But also in understanding his love, it not only compels us, but quite simply, it just radically and dra dramatically changes us. We're changed by the love of Christ. That's really what he's referring to there in verses 16, 17, and 18. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. And all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. You and I gather on Sunday mornings and we gather on Wednesdays. And when we gather here on Wednesdays, we begin a time of worship and singing. The reason I'm so grateful for these musicians and grateful for these who lead us in worship 
in the singing of these songs, these songs of love and adoration, his great love for us and our love for him. Because there is something about the love of Christ when you understand his love, when you begin to get a glimpse of his great love for you, it it changes you. It, it radically changes you. And one of the ways that it changes you, it changes how you view people how you view other people. It changes what he's saying there in verse number 16 is it changes your worldview. Look at verse number 16 again of 2 Corinthians 5. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. The NIV gives a little clarity of what he's speaking of. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. What is the worldly point of view? I am a white, Anglo-Saxon, middle-class male. You might be a part of a, a particular political party. You may drive a certain kind of car. You may dress a certain kind of way. And the world will evaluate you based on those standards. Because those are the things that we can touch and see here and now. It's one of the reasons that we are seeing and hearing much today about identity politics. Because it's how our world views people. Paul is saying that when you have experienced the great love of Christ, it not only motivates you and compels you, but it changes how you look at people. You don't look at people the way the world looks at people. The way the world looks at people is what color their skin is and how they're dressed and where they live and what they drive. But when you are compelled by the love of Christ and so changed that when you look at a person, it's not the color of their skin, it's not the clothes, it's not the car they drive, but you think initially that's a soul. And I wonder if their soul has been reconciled with God. I wonder if they've been born again. I wonder if they've been saved. Because every human soul will one day face the judgment of God. Every single human soul will someday meet God. That's what matters. Not the color of their skin, not the clothes, not where they live, not their culture, not their race, but does their soul know Christ? There's only two kinds of people in the world, the saints and the ain'ts, amen? The lost and the found, the enemies of God who, were, who are still enemies and the enemies whom God has reconciled to himself. But someday we'll all die. We'll all face eternity. And what, when that day comes, money and politics and how attractive you are won't matter. The only thing that matters, do you know Christ? Have you been reconciled to God? And knowing the love of Christ transforms how you see people. Can I tell you what I've discovered? The love of Christ will not only transform how you view people, how you see people, watch this, but how you treat people. And Christians are notorious in America of how bad we treat people. How many of you have ever served or worked in a restaurant? Would you raise your hand? You know where I'm going with this. When you worked in the restaurant, you loathed working on Sundays because you had to deal with that church crowd because they're the cheapest. They complain the most, and they tip the least. And we will treat our, 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 our waiter, our waitress, the serving staff, we will treat them so bad right after church after they have seen us pray at the table. So they know we came from church. They know that we are professing to be Christians, and yet we treat them so bad. When you have experience, when you know the love of Christ, 
It affects you. It changes you. It changes the way you view people. It changes the way you treat people. I mean, so very mindful that every soul is eternal, that every human being will one day meet God. Charles Spurgeon, this is strong, Charles Spurgeon once again said this, if sinners will be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, at least let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions and let not one go there unwarned and unprayed for. And so when you've been reconciled to God, the love of Christ, it transforms how you view other people, how you treat other people. But listen, it radically changes you. It changes your values. It changes your behaviors. When you have experienced the love of Christ, it changes you. Everything about you. That's what he means in verse number 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. The old has died and has been buried. And behold, all things are made new. Before Christ, we were slaves to sin. I mean, that's the picture. You know that's the picture all throughout the New Testament. That before Christ, you and I were slaves to sin. I want you to just picture in your mind a, a real physical. You are, you are chained hand and foot. You are chained every day. Every day. But then one day, someone came and set you free. That's the picture. The picture is that you were once a sin. To yourself, to your flesh, to your selfishness, to sin, every day a slave, but then radically set free in Christ. One of the, one of the things that, that, that we just find so very difficult is when we see a Christian or one who has professed Christ, but there's been, watch this, but when there's been no change in their life. They may have come down an aisle. They may have cried some big crocodile tears. They may have even gotten wet. But there's been no change in their life. So what has happened is they were in bondage. They were in chains. They were slaves, were set free, but then decided to go back and be a slave again. Why would anyone do that? That's the reason, by the way, a little bit later here in 2 Corinthians, Paul says, you better, you might want to examine yourself and see if you're really in the faith. Because 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, listen, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. They have been set free. Never, never to willingly go back and be a slave again. The love of Christ compels us. The love of Christ changes us. It changes how we view people and how we we treat people. I mean, we ourselves are just radically changed together. That's the the ministry of reconciliation. That's That's the picture. So then Paul says, this is the ministry. This is the mission of God, the ministry of reconciliation, and you ought to be a part of it because of the love of Christ. It compels you, and you're changed, and you see people different, and you're different. So therefore, you share what? The message of reconciliation. And by the way, the message of reconciliation is a very specific message. So what is the specific message. Well, let me first tell you what it is not. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. That's true. That is not the gospel. If you'll ask Jesus into your heart, one day you'll go to heaven. That is not 
the gospel. That's not the gospel. We live in a a nation as divided as it is. And you and I would probably agree so, in many ways, so very far away from God. But still today, the majority of Americans, when you ask them, do you believe in God, they will say, yes, absolutely. Do you believe in Jesus? Does it offend you when I say that Jesus is the Son of God and he came and he lived a sinless life, he died on a cruel cross, and he was raised again the third day? Does that offend you? No, it does not offend me. It really doesn't. Do you know what bothers them? Do you know what offends them? It's when you and I say this. Apart from Christ, you are an enemy of God. I'm not an enemy of God. That offends me that you would call me an enemy of God. But that's the truth. That is the truth. See, the word, and you've heard me say this many, many times, the word gospel means what? Good news. The word gospel means good news. Here's what we know about the good news. Pay attention. In order to really understand the good and the good news, you have to really understand the bad of the bad news. If you really get the bad of the bad news, then you can get the good in the good news. Here's the bad news. The bad news is, apart from Christ, you are an enemy of God. Romans chapter 5 and verse number 10 says this. Romans 5 and verse number 10, for if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, now that we are, what? Say the word, reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Before Christ, without Christ, Every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, in their sin and their selfishness, they make themselves an enemy of God. That's the bad in the bad news. You, sir, you, ma'am, are an enemy of God because of your sin and your selfishness. That's the bad in the bad news. So really, then how are we? reconciled to God. How are we reconciled to God? Let's look again at verse number 20 and then verse number 21. Verse number 20 says this, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Here's the, here's the bad the, in the bad news. You In your sin, your selfishness have placed yourself as an enemy of God. So we implore you as an ambassador, we plead with you, be reconciled to God. So what is the specific gospel message? Verse 21. Paul lays it all out to go to verse number 21. Let's just, let's just walk through it. For our sake, on our behalf, on your behalf, he, that is God, made him, that is Christ, to be sin who knew no sin. Let's just pause there. Here's the good and the good news. The bad and the bad news is in your sin and selfishness, you're an enemy of God. Here's the good and the good news. On your behalf, Long before you ever thought of him, God made him, his son, who knew no sin, to become sin. In other words, here's the picture. Look up here. Here's what God did. God placed his son, sent his son, placed his son on the cross and placed on his son all of the sin that had ever been committed and all of the sin that ever would be committed, and placed it on his son, who was tempted in every way, yet he never did sin. He was righteous, he was innocent, he was perfect. And God somehow placed it all on him. By the way, not just the sin, but the punishment of that sin. 
Here's the word. Are you ready? God poured out on his dear son his wrath, the wrath of God. He said, that's a mighty strong word. It's a Bible word. It's what the Bible teaches what God did. Romans chapter number one. Romans chapter one teaches us about this wrath that was poured out upon his son. The wrath of God poured out. Romans chapter one, verse number 18 tells us the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, poured out on his son. Can you imagine as a parent I can't conceive of my sons when they were young taking their little hands and driving a nail through their hands, driving a nail through their feet. But that is exactly what God did. Let's go back to the verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, the simple message, the specific message. For our sake, for your sake, on your behalf, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, to take your, the wrath of God for your sake so that in him, that is Jesus, we, that is us, might become the righteousness of God. Here's the incredible thing. There's a reversal that takes place. God takes all of the punishment, all of the wrath that you deserve and that you should receive and placed it on his son. And he takes all of the righteousness of his son and he places it on your account. So I took several minutes to share the good and the good news. Let me simplify for it. You could say it this way. Though sinful man has sinned against a holy God. God loves us so much that he sent Jesus to live, die, and rise for us so that those of us who believe in him will be saved from the penalty of sin. Hey, in fact, let me do this. Let me break it down even more. God, man, Christ, response. God is holy. Man is sinful. Jesus died and rose for us. And the response is faith and repentance. That's the good and the good news. That is the message of reconciliation. Many of you know the expression St. Francis of Assisi. He said, live and communicate the gospel every day. And if you have to, use words. I understand the sentiment, but there are many of us, many of us, who live the Christian life, and people see that we're different, and we believe that's enough. Listen to me. Look up here. There are people who die every day knowing you were different, but never were told why you were different. Be different. Live for Christ, but they need to hear the good news of the gospel. God is on a mission, reconciling, redeeming people to himself. He invites us to be a part of it, to live on mission every day, an everyday missionary with the ministry of reconciliation and the message of reconciliation as an ambassador of Jesus Christ. In the next couple of weeks, we're going to learn practically. I'm going to give you tools to help you daily live on mission. Let's pray together. Would you bow your head with me? The band's going to come and lead us in a song. A time of response. In fact, pastors are going to come and stand here at the front because there are some of you this morning that would like a pastor to pray with them, to pray for them. There are some of you this morning have come to the realization that you have never been changed. That, in fact, you have never been reconciled with God. And the invitation this morning is for you to step out in some courage and come to one of these pastors and say, I need to be reconciled with God. And you will leave today a new 
creation. The old behind you. The old buried here. And you can walk out today a new creation. Others of us, there's people in our lives that we need to engage. We need to be an ambassador. We need to join God in his mission. And we need to ask for the opportunity to share the bad of the bad news and the good of the good news. Stand with me as I pray. Heavenly Father, in these next moments as we pray for our moms and dads, our brothers and sisters, our sons, our daughters, our co-workers, our neighbors, our friends, those that have not been reconciled with you. As we pray for those that are right now, as of this moment, they are your enemy. Because of their choices, because of their decisions, because of their sinfulness, they are an enemy. God, I pray that because of the love that you have for us, the love of the Lord Jesus, that we would understand today and we would be motivated today and we would be compelled today to share in the ministry of reconciliation. God, simply this, that we would join you on your mission to join you on your mission of reconciling people to yourself. Help us to see ourselves as you see us as everyday missionaries. I pray for these this morning who need Christ. I pray for these this morning who need a, a new view of people, a new perspective in how they treat people. I pray for these today who would catch a glimpse of your great love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship together.